1993, it was decided that the millennium should be celebrated through an exhibition, echoing the Great Exhibition and the Festival of Britain before it. Situated on a disused gas works on the Greenwich Peninsula, close to the Meridian Line, the Millennium Commission set out a tender to design a large, open plan and easily buildable structure in which to house such an exhibition. The tender was won by the architects Roger Sturken Harbour and Engineers Bureau Happold, leading to the Millennium Dome that we are all familiar with today. This video will focus predominantly on the architectural intent of the Millennium Dome and how it is achieved through the designer's approach to structural engineering. After careful consideration of the alternative options, such as a geodesic dome, membrane structure, large span truss and concrete shell, Rogers and Bureau Happold decided the most plausible solution was to produce an open plan, tensile dome shaped structure. This provided shelter whilst enabling construction to be under budget and on schedule. The finished result has since become an iconic piece of design, with a beautifully expressed, innovative and inspiring structural form. Although it appears like a standard dome, where loads are supported largely in compression, the structure in fact acts much more like a cable supported bridge, with the roof hung off a series of cables. Twelve 100 metre tall masts support cables which extend from the top and bottom of each mast. These cables then in turn support further cables which run around the full circumference of the dome. The radial cables support a 1mm thick roof formed from fibreglass which is coated in Teflon. The dome is a tensile structure where the majority of members are in pure tension with the isolated mass in compression. By removing bending, the structure is more efficient. Creating large structures is easier with tension members as they retain strength no matter how long they are. The tension members are pre-stressed to ensure they are the correct length and don't go slack, independent of how the structure is loaded. Asymmetric loads from wind or snow are balanced by internal ties to the masts. The pre-stressing in the cables also reduces deflections in the roof, which can be very large over the 365 metre span. The radial cables are elevated off the roof and the fabric is pre-tensioned to prevent pooling of water and snow. Due to the black wall tunnel vent, a hole in the roof was needed. This would have created uneven forces in the dome. Instead, a net of cable mimics the roof fabric. The tunnel is bridged over to ensure the masts do not cause any damage to it. The masts are inclined outwards to resist both lateral and vertical loads. A concrete compression ring surrounds the entire building to resist the horizontal forces of the backstays and prevent the building collapsing inwards. The raised mast connections prevent the tie-back cables interrupting internal spaces, and the pyramid creates greater lateral stability. Fiberglass coated with Teflon was chosen for the roof material. Its translucency allows light into the dome while still providing a weatherproof shell. It was chosen over PVC coated polyester, as it is less prone to discoloration and dirt retention. Its higher upfront cost was balanced by its longer lifespan, which enabled a long-term legacy of the dome to be planned. Fiberglass is very strong in tension, as well as being incredibly light. It was produced in large sheets and was heat bonded together on site for quick installation. The steel masts and cables were created from off-the-shelf components where possible. This reduced the cost and increased the speed of construction. The 12 masts resemble the Skylon, a sculpture built for the Festival of Britain in 1951. In the design of the structure, steps were taken to increase speed and sustainability in the construction process. An example of this is in splitting each of the masts into six individual segments. Each segment was designed so they could be fabricated in one go and be transported via road without notifying the council. As mentioned previously, the masts act mainly in compression, transferring the load from the cables down to the ground. Compression members are prone to buckling. However, this effect can be reduced by managing imperfections, removing additional moments, and by increasing the cross-sectional area. In the case of the Millennium Dome, 
bending was reduced by ensuring that all the cables had theoretical lines of intersection at the top. This proved to be a complicated 3D connection with 23 cables requiring support. The bottom of the mast was also pinned, which allowed for small rotations. This ensured there was no accumulation of moments whilst the roof deflected under varying loads. By using eight circular hollow sections separated by bracing elements at every two and a half metres, the geometric benefits of a big cross section were achieved whilst also keeping the weight low. The resistance to buckling was helped further by increasing the overall diameter of the mass in the middle. This is the most likely point to fail during buckling. Tensile structures carry the loads via reasonably large displacements. Although very efficient, loading and unloading of tensile structures can cause fatigue failure within the cables. This has been minimised by pinning the cables at each node within the structure, allowing for free rotation without the risk of stress buildup. Prior to development, the Greenwich Peninsula was largely a barren, derelict site. Ground contamination caused by a gasworks facility and an absence of public transport links made the site the perfect opportunity for regeneration, of which the Millennium Dome was the central component. One of the Millennium Experience targets was for 50% of the journeys to the venue to be made by public transport. In response, a brand new underground station was built in conjunction with a bus station and a ferry stop. The Millennium Dome was in fact the first visitor attraction in the world to not have a car park. These transport links were built in conjunction with decontamination of the site, enabling future growth and social sustainability in the peninsula and the wider built environment. The structure itself responds to its environment by protecting visitors inside of an all-encompassing structure from the strong winds that the exposed peninsula experiences. This structure's wide span and external positioning of utilities equipment has made the dome incredibly versatile. Recycled materials were used throughout the build, including reclaimed timber in the flood defences. The utility equipment was specified to be resellable after the Millennium Experience, whilst only necessary areas are heated or cooled. A rainwater harvesting system, in conjunction with wastewater recycling and a natural filtration landscape, provides sufficient water to flush the high-efficiency toilets inside of the dome. The translucent roof reduces the need for artificial lighting inside the arena, while sewage and waste is used to produce electricity. Since the year 2000, these features have enabled the dome to host a variety of events, including a music festival and a winter wonderland, before being repurposed as the highly successful and economically sustainable entertainment venue, the O2 Arena. The dome's lightweight and efficient structural form, which weighs less than the volume of air enclosed, in combination with its versatility, make it a role model for low embodied carbon structures. The high cost of the Millennium Experience project and lack of a clear legacy initially attracted criticism. The structure itself, however, was a relatively small component of the project cost and has since proven itself to be versatile and highly successful. After a £500 million renovation, it is estimated that the O2 Arena now makes around £500 million a year for the London economy. This is in addition to completely rejuvenating the Greenwich Peninsula area, bringing new transport links and huge investments in housing and other infrastructure. Despite the positive outcome, the structure was notoriously hard to retrofit and the O2 Arena had to be constructed without the use of cranes due to the height of the roof. Legacy should have therefore been considered from the outset. In summary, not only has the dome provided an inspirational, unusual structure, it did so at an incredible value per metre squared of usable floor space. It also satisfies the three pillars of sustainability, economic, environmental and social, through its low cost, minimal material use and wider transformation of the Greenwich Peninsula. It is now an integral piece of modern architecture in London and continues to attract visitors to marvel at its scale and striking form.